Hi, I'm St. Paul Mayor Melvin Carter. Each June, we commemorate Juneteenth, the oldest known celebration which marks the emancipation of the last remaining African captives on June 19, 1865, ending the institution of American slavery. Years earlier, in September 1862, President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, declaring that as of January 1, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state in rebellion against the United States shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. However, it would take the Civil War and the passage of the 13th Amendment to truly end the brutal institution of American slavery in the United States. Even after the Civil War ended in April 1865, most slaves in Texas were still unaware of their freedom. This began to change as Union soldiers arrived in Galveston. On June 19, 1865, Major General Gordon Granger, the commanding officer of the District of Texas, ordered that the people of Texas are informed that, in accordance with the proclamation from the Executive of the United States, all slaves are free, which involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. With this historic order, Reconstruction in Texas began, and with it, the last remaining African captives in our country were emancipated. As early as 1866, freed African Americans in Galveston observed Emancipation Day, as it was first known, which we now call Juneteenth more than 150 years later. We invite you to join the city of St. Paul and members of our community in commemorating Juneteenth 2021. Today, we reflect on the strength courage and resilience of our ancestors as we celebrate the triumph of the human spirit and acknowledge the work that remains ahead. Thank you. Southern trees bear strange fruit. There's blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree pastoral seeds of the gallant south with the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth scent of magnolia Sweet and fresh, and then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Here's a fruit for the crows to pluck, for the rain to gather, for the wind to suck, for the sun to rise. For the tree to drop Here is a strange and bitter crop Oh, these northern streets They bear the same fruit Cap still on his knees there's more blood on their blues. Black voices screaming in the summer breeze. He can't breathe. Stop this, please. Some mothers nurse and sing lullabies and rock their babes as one of us dies. The scent of summer bloom, so sweet and fresh. Juneteenth to me means joy and celebration, obviously. Uh, it's the day in which we were informed that slavery was no longer the law of the land, uh, and that we should celebrate that. But it also, to me, really means about determination. Determination not to forget uh, our, our country's past, its history. And in particular, I kind of think of Abraham Lincoln's call at Gettysburg for the birth of a new nation to rid itself of the original sin of slavery. 
I think of the March on Washington with Dr. Martin Luther King standing at the a foot of the Lincoln Memorial talking about a check for insufficient funds being given to black people. And when will the nation live up to its highest ideals and promises of opportunity and education and employment um, and justice. And I think of the challenge of even though we got rid of chattel slavery, I think of the language within the 13th Amendment which provides for an exception to slavery and that's for when individuals have committed a crime. And I'm really touched by the language and eloquence of Professor Michelle Alexander talking about mass incarceration in which individuals who committed a crime therefore forfeit their rights to employment and housing and in so many ways by more than the 50,000 collateral laws on the books that deny individuals with criminal history an opportunity to gainfully connect back with society, creating in essence a second class citizenship, uh, primarily born on the backs of African Americans. So to me, when I think of Juneteenth, I think of determination. I think we have to be determined to eradicate mass incarceration within our society. We should not have second class citizenship the way that we do within mass incarceration. I think of our determination that we have to do more within the space of education. There's no reason in Minnesota why a black child is eight times more likely to be suspended than a white child. Uh, in our classrooms. The disparity gaps of graduation, we should eradicate those. Those shouldn't be allowed to stand going forward. We should have meaningful employment opportunities and more importantly, the opportunity to pass generational wealth. Um, these are the things that I feel that we have to be committed to. We have to be determined. If we're truly to live up to what Juneteenth really calls for is the full integration of citizenship for African Americans, these are the things that we have to be determined to address and move forward. I am so happy uh, to be a part of this project, and I truly hope that Juneteenth will become a national holiday and will have the right determination to make sure that all are fully afforded their rights. Sadly, this historical moment or that historical moment has yielded slow steps of progress and a long and unrelenting struggle for black people to fully reach liberty, justice, and equality and that change has never happened simultaneously for all people. Juneteenth for me is a celebration of my ancestors' freedom. Freedom that came with a hefty price tag of racism. Yet still, it's a painful reminder that we have what feels like insurmountable tasks to escape and eliminate the shackles that bind us in an unequal and unjust system of policies, practices, laws, and barriers that impede our progress as black people and for so many denying the true tenets of liberty and justice for all. I feel commemorating and celebrating Juneteenth at this juncture in history is more important than ever before. It's a day of reckoning and a time for America to truly come to terms with its legacy of slavery, acknowledging the long struggle for equal rights, both past and present, and realizing that as the old saying goes, nobody is free until everybody is free. Juneteenth is like that hallmark that says we fully should embrace the ideals of unconditional freedom and racial equality for black people and for all people. As black people, we are people of hope and faith, and that in 2021, our ancestral spirit will continue to be ignited for making meaningful change and assurance that black lives truly matter. We will push the sense of urgency to dismantle structural racism and continue our fight for its liberty and justice for all. Juneteenth for me will be my celebration of hope and resilience. Hope for when racism and discrimination against people no longer remain entrenched in social and structural problems in America. And especially at Nichanga Place, where we are committed to working towards progress in our society by dismantling those systems of oppression, especially as it relates to the African American men we serve. Let Juneteenth be our reminder of the work that we need. Good afternoon, Duluth. What a beautiful day we have. Um, it's been amazing, and I want to share this little piece in, in reference to what you shared. My father was in the Air Force, and we landed in Duluth in 1967. 
1080s, 9th Street, we used to live on 5th Street. I went to Washington in junior high and a graduate Central Trojan, 1981. But in reference to what you said, I never heard this story in my years here. And I didn't leave till I was 20. Never heard this story and had to hear it this way after the mass. So this needs to be, this story needs to be told. It's, it's, it's an intricate piece of our history that has never been told. The Jama Place, we're an office in St. Paul. We work with most young black males in Minneapolis and St. Paul, 18 to 30. We have four main pillars. We have an education pillar, we have a housing pillar, a health and wellness, and we have employment. Uh, we have a number of ways we build a brotherhood. It's about us connecting our high context coaching. These brothers can call us any time of day for any need, any of our coaches. And we have a very close relationship. And that's what's gonna help these brothers succeed in life. We adjust in less than 24 hours. We left last Friday, all of us here and some of the coaches. We flew down to Atlanta last Friday and took a bus to Selma, Alabama. Spent the day there, went to Montgomery. We've been to Tuskegee Institute. Uh, we had a two-hour meeting with Dr. Bernard Lafayette, who was Martin Luther King's strategist. Uh, it was just an amazing weekend. And we went to the Peace and Justice Museum, the Legacy Museum, and we had the honor of seeing these three gentlemen at the lynching memorial. So we brought Duluth down there, and we brought Duluth back. So in less than 24 hours, we were in the deep south, and now we're up in the deep north. So. Um, my name is Cedric Smith. I'm a Ujamaa man. On the evening of June 15, 1920, three black men wrongly accused of raping a white woman were abducted from the Duluth City Jail. A mob numbering between five and 10,000 people gathered outside the jail limits. And they savagely beat and tortured these three young men, then hung them from a lamppost in downtown Duluth. This grim spectacle of a mob posing over the lynched bodies was later photographed and put on a postcard. At a time in America when the lynching of black men was all too common, it was still widely known as one of the most heinous lynchings of the 1920s. Until recently, this event has gone largely forgotten. And the names of these three men were almost forgotten as well. Say their names. Elias Clayton. Isaac, Isaac McGee. Isaac McGee. Thank you, guys. And I think what happens so often is that people just try to get through the problem without actually getting to real solutions. They just wanted to kind of, and I, and I sensed that. And so it wasn't a shock to me, although it was devastating. But I'm, I'm just thrilled that the community has reacted and responded in a way that has insisted that, that, that there be change. And um, the lawyers involved in the prosecution of the officer who I've been in contact with, you know, it shouldn't be an historic achievement, but it was. Yeah. You know, was it was. Yes, yes. yes. Yeah. It's devastating that something like that had to happen, mm -hmm. but it's encouraging that there has been this response led by people in Minneapolis, in Minnesota, and uh, and I I hope it continues to shake around the world. So we've got a lot of work to do. When you think about how Minnesota reacted, yeah. But the thing for me as an elder, yeah, I had we knew black that officers killed black men. Yes, I'd never seen it. Yes, we'd never seen yeah. it. Yeah. And we saw. So it. that's right. That's right. And that was, I think, I say to George, I say to him, we hated to lose you. Yes, that's right. But you allowed yes. the truth. That's right. To come out. That's right. Putting his knee. That's right. On you, that's killing right. you. That's we right. saw it. Yes, that's right. Can't just say that's it right. anymore. And we saw his humanity yes. and the value of his life exactly. taken away from him in ways that people, it just made it hard for people to keep saying it's not a big deal. Exactly. And so I, we're going to keep pushing. I keep telling people, we have to decide, we have to see 
whether 2020 was like 1955, which was the beginning of a whole civil rights movement that changed things in this country, or is it like 1968, a moment of a lot of anguish and a, that was then followed by a period of not much oh, progress. Yeah. And so we're working to try to make it like 1955, which yeah. starts the kind of work that has to be done. And, and that's our, that's My mother our. was a domestic worker her entire life. But whenever she took me anywhere, she had this dignity and this grace and this presence and you wouldn't, I, I would just be so proud to walk next to her. Yeah. And that's what came through, Thank through your you. whole life. Thank uh, you and very I know much. coming from Texas and in Fisk and going to a place like Minnesota where there just wasn't a very big, invisible black community Thank must have been really challenging, yes, but you did way it. Way back then. Yeah. Uh, I think what helps us, yeah. and particularly those from your grandmother's yeah. ancestry, yeah. I think. Our people are very proud yes. of who they are yes. and what they can do. Yes. Even though sometimes I was saying walking through the museum, yeah. you say they put up with so much. Oh, absolutely. And in spite of that, That's look right. where they are. That's right. And it's true. It is that true. Many of our people don't know. Yes. And I'm holding us. Yes black adults yes. and their ancestors yeah. responsible right. for their not knowing. That's exactly right. And I, I look at that. Yeah. I look at the fact, remembering the creation of Juneteenth, yes. my hometown, yes. my parents. <laughs> I, I Sometimes I wonder if it's a good thing to share or not. But in my day, when they opened the white parks, mm -hmm for black children mm -hmm. to attend. My parents said, if you can't go mm -hmm. every day, mm -hmm. then I don't want you to go on these special days. Yeah. Yeah. So that was true. Yeah. And we observed Juneteenth in a very different way for us yeah. than was uh, being shared out there. Yeah. So the experience of us as a people. Yes, so important. And the pride. Yes, that's that right. Our ancestors in spite of it, when I look at the museum yeah, pieces, yeah, oh yeah, my, yeah, yeah. and then those statues in front of the museum, yeah. you say, how could they that, that's tolerate it so true. That? That's right. And I think a lot about that myself because my grandmother was the daughter of people who were born in slavery. And she would tell me about how committed her father was to educating everybody. He learned to read while he was enslaved. So after emancipation, formerly enslaved people who couldn't read would come to their house every week <clears throat> and he would stand on the porch and just read all the newspapers mm -hmm. and people would sit there and take them because they, wanted to, they know. wanted to know. And she was so proud of him for, for having that skill. And of course she wanted it too. Right. And even though there weren't schools, she learned to read and yeah. she gave that to my mother. My mother gave that to me, and I don't think we have taught um, enough about what sustained our ancestors. Right. And it was strength and courage, but it was also love. And that's Absolutely. the thing that I've been trying to talk more about because I think about- I hear you say. You know, yeah. my great grandfather was enslaved, treated horribly, and when emancipation came, he didn't choose hatred. He didn't choose retribution. He didn't choose violence. Exactly. He chose community and trying to find a way to make peace with the people who had enslaved him. Exactly. And you know that was about a love of others. And he gave that to my grandmother. They had to flee uh, the Deep South at the end of the 20, 20, 19th century. And she came to Philadelphia. And despite all the hardship, she had 10 children. And even though it was tough, she yeah. felt like she had enough love to give her children. Exactly. That she wasn't worried about segregation. She wasn't worried about Jim Crow. She had to manage it, exactly. but still felt like her love was strong enough to bring these beautiful kids into the world to overcome those things. And my mom was the same way. We grew up poor in this rural, racially segregated community. And I think about how our people have a prior to elevated love in the face of all of those horrible exactly. things that you see at the museum. Exactly. And we have to just keep giving that to our, our young people. And that's the period that I'm very troubled about. Yeah. And try, I've been thinking a lot about 
what you, my grandfather went as far as the eighth grade. He yeah. was a black minister. Interesting. Traveled throughout yeah. the South yeah. teaching the Bible. Oh, yeah. And teaching black men to yes. know how to read yep. the Bible and to yeah. preach. So having grown up in a family that believed in education, yes. number one, yes. my parents were blessed. My mother and dad graduated from Purview College. Wow. And so that was a part of our sure. background. And the people within our community who told us, yeah. I want you to do X, Y, Z. Exactly. And there was no, yeah, you know, that's if right. you feel like that's it, right. well, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. That was a directive that's and right. we took it. That's right. But I think about right now, I worry mm -hmm. that perhaps we adults mm -hmm. have become so afraid of our own children yes. Yes. that we're not in yep. their mix that's right. to that's show right. them as our parents, yes. my parents, yes. and your grand, that's right, uh, were in our mix. That's right. So they knew what we were doing. That's right. That's and right. And you just couldn't yeah. just pretend. Yeah. That's right. That you didn't know. That's right. And they loved you. That's the yeah. piece that I think our children yeah. are missing. Yeah. Mother, mother, both of them, knowing how Dad wanted desperately yeah. to be a lawyer. Yeah. And at, in 1926, yeah. that wasn't possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. he it's, found another way. He found another way. Yeah. He found another way. And I think you're so right. I mean, it's like you said, when you went off, you knew, and they told you you were going to have to do X, Y, and Z. Okay. You knew that you weren't going off just for you. You okay. were going off for them. For your community, you were for all, all of those people. You were carrying their hopes, right. their dreams, exactly. their aspirations, their uh, imaginings of a better world. And, right. and I think about that so much in my community. When integration came, I started in a colored school. And then when integration came, I remember how all of the black women in my little village got together. And they were worried about what was going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and there was a year of transition, and most of the people said, well, we're going to wait until everybody has to go. We, they were just nervous. My mother was like, well, I want my children to get a little bit more, so I'm going to send them now. And they said, well, we'll watch out. And I remember getting on this. this I just remembered this. Uh, getting on the bus to go to the white school, and my mother got me ready. She tied my shoes. She had to go to work, but she tied my shoes, got me all dressed or something. And it was rainy, and I and I went outside, and I got on the bus, and uh, just started raining. I didn't have a place to stand or something. Somehow I got some mud on my pants, and I was waiting for the bus. And two of the other black women in the neighborhood came walking by. They saw me standing there and said, get in this car till the bus comes. And then the woman said, you've got mud on your pants. I've never will forget it. And she got out her rag. And she said, I'm not going to let you go to that white school oh, wearing this mug. Right. Your mother doesn't want you. She dressed you up. We, you're representing all of us. Exactly. And it's something small like that. But when somebody does that for you, you know that you are loved, not just by the people who are your biological people, mm -hmm. but by your entire community. As we grow up in an environment of love and protection right. and modeling. That's right. That's right. Love and care. That's right. And not counting yeah. your dollars yeah. and cents, yeah, yeah. then there's hope for the next generation. Yes, absolutely. So absolutely. I'm holding on. There you go. Yes, that's that's, that's you right. Are. I'm going to do just like they used to, they used to tell me, you keep on holding on. Keep on. <laughs> keep, on keep on. Keep on. Keep on. Keep on. That's on. it. That's what and I'm going to do it. And I know you're going to do well, it. I but we are you. so, so, so honored to have you here. It just means the world to us. I couldn't yeah. believe, even though I love Monique, yeah. believe everything she has told me. <laughs> and she said that I would actually have a moment yeah. to greet oh. you. <laughs> I, I just knew she had performed a miracle. I will listen. So I, I thank you. I could not let you be in our space and thank not have you. the privilege of just That's spending time nice. and thanking you and just celebrating all that you've done and i hope you'll come back we're going to be having a whole lot of new stuff open up at the end of the year and we have a big event 
that we're gonna plan, and so you're gonna hear from us. Juneteenth is uh, another symbol of what could happen, not only in terms of uh, those of us here in the U.S., but in other places around the world and over the centuries. And we do not know what the future will bring. And it's symbolic because it's not only uh, people of color, but it's people of different uh, orientations. But we're all the same. And once people realize that we have much more in common than the differences that have been made, then people will come together in a different kind of way and see how we can serve each other and be able to give to each other and then make a difference in terms of our own worth in life. They still fetish for brown pounds of flesh. So change your laws and keep your codes to never pay us what is owed. And if you need us terrified, then your cause ain't just, ain't in God we trust. And no, you must. Your leaders lied. Northern Fruits. I wrote it after the murder of George Floyd. I wrote it as a poem because I was unable to sing. And that's my contribution. Mm -hmm. 